offer you our undivided attention. Ladies and gentlemen, how solemn and beautiful is the thought that the earliest pioneer of, of civilization was never the railroad, never the newspaper, never the missionary, but whiskey. <laughs> However, truth is the most valuable thing we possess. Perhaps that is why we economize it. Now, I want to congratulate all of you for, for taking a chance on this program and being here today. In spite of the fact that my recent presentation to your fellow countrymen in uh, Wanganui was not all that well received. No, not at all. So I was curious what the reception would be here. We'll see. Now, in my youth, I went to San Francisco. I was looking for a job out there, but I was very particular what type of job I would get. You see, I didn't want to work. So I became a newspaper reporter. Oh, I hated to do it, but I couldn't find honest employment. I've often had to serve time that way. Why, when I was putting, putting together my first book, I served a stretch in Washington as a newspaper correspondent. Every day, I went up to the Congress, and that grand old National Benevolent Society for the Agitated and Helpless, and I reported on the inmates there. <laughs> and it was very entertaining. Why, I had never seen a body of men with tongues so handy and information so uncertain. <laughs> I have one of those men had been present at the point when the deed he was about to say, let there be light, <laughs> we never would have had it. <laughs> well, as you can see, I, I'm trying to throw a little variety into these services. For example, I, I recently wrote to Mr. Andrew Carnegie requesting a hymn book. Here it is. My dear Mr. Carnegie, I see by the papers that you are very prosperous. Now, I want to get a hymn book. It costs two dollars. I will bless you, God will bless you, and it will do a great deal of good. Truly yours, Mark Twain. Oh, P.S. Don't send me the hymn book, send the two dollars. <laughs> well, I wanted to select it myself. No, I'm not lying to you. I don't tell lies. I differ from George Washington. I have a higher and grander standard of principle. The George could not tell a lie. I can, but I won't. <laughs> oh, I used to tell lies. But I've given it up. The field is overrun with amateurs. <laughs> well, when I look around me and contemplate the lumbering, slovenly line of the present day, it grieves me to see a noble art so prostituted. In my day, a liar was a liar. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the that the habit of lying could suffer any decay, because it couldn't. For the lie is eternal. It is man's best and surest friend. Shall not perish from the earth while Congress remains in session. <laughs> no, when I talk about the decay in the art of lying, I'm talking about the silent lie. It requires no art. You simply can't steal and conceal the truth. 
For example, it would not be possible for a humane and intelligent person to invent a, a rational excuse for slavery. However, in the early days of the emancipation agitation in the North, those agitators got small help from anyone. Argue, plead, pray as they might. They could not break that universal stillness that reigned from pulpit and press right down to the bottom of society. The clammy stillness created and maintained by the lie of silent assertion. The silent assertion that there wasn't anything going on in which humane and intelligent people ought to be interested. Well, when a whole nation of people can conspire to propagate a gigantic new lie like that one in the interest of tyrannies and shams, why should we care anything about the trifling ones told by individuals, huh? <laughs> why make them undesirable? Why not be honest and honorable and lie out loud every chance we get? Why should we help the nation lie the whole day long and then object to tell one little insignificant private lie <laughs> for our own interest, just for the refreshment of it. To get the rancid taste out of our mouths. No, there is no art to this silent lie. It's timid and shabby. Hmm. Well, Hmm. I've been addressing my remarks to the uh, young people in the audience. Ah, the old ones are past saving. But I do hope the young ones will understand me and take heed. I hope it, but I doubt it. When I was a boy at 14, my father was so stupid I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But by the time I was 21, I was astonished how much he'd learned in the last seven years. <laughs> okay, now, now I want to bring you a selection from Huckleberry Finn. Now, Huckleberry Finn is a story about a boy. Many of you have been boys. The rest of you have had a great deal to do with boys. Now, Huckleberry Finn was a boy who lived a great many years ago in the Mississippi River Valley. He was ignorant, unwashed, insufficiently fed, but he had as good a heart as ever any boy had. And he was the only truly independent fellow, boy or man, in the community. For this reason, I suppose, he was continually happy. Now, in the book, Huckleberry tells his own story all by himself. As soon as he gets his hat on. Learned to read and write, 
say my multiplication table of 6 times 7 is 35. <laughs> but I couldn't get any further than that, I reckon, and shall I live forever? <laughs> and then one night, I got the can and went up to my room. Woo! There said, Pat, his own self. Well, he lit into me something terrible for putting on airs, dressing up, going to school and all. And then he'd catch me and he'd tuck me up the river to a little old cabin on the Illinois shore. Huh? Oh, Pat, he was so handy with his hickory, I couldn't hardly stand it. I was all over welts. Well, I ran off from Pat soon after that. He had out on Jackson's Island. And that's where I met Ms. Watson's Jim. And he said he run off too. Well, I promised him. I promised. Okay, I promised I wouldn't tell on him. But I know I'd done wrong. People would despise me, call me low-down abolitionist and all, but I didn't care. I wasn't going back there again anyway. Well, Jim and me, we found us a section of log raft. We set off down the river together. We'd run nights, laid up here daytimes, and we just let that raft float wherever the current wanted to take it. Oh, it is lovely to live on the raft. Oh, we lay on our backs, smoke our pipes, look way up into the sky. Not a cloud in it. Huh. Sky looks ever so deep when lay on your back in the moonlight. I never done it before. <laughs> and how far our body could hear across the water, such as at nighttime. Well, I fall asleep. Yeah. And then sometime Jim, he wouldn't wake me when it was my turn to stand watch. He often done that. Well, I wake up long about daybreak, and there sat Jim head down twixt his knees, just moaning and moaning. Well, I never took no notice, never let on, but I know what it was for. He was miss, missing his wife and cheering way back yonder. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I, reckon, I reckon he cared for his folks as much as white folks cared for theirs. <laughs> Don't seem natural, but I reckon it's so. <laughs> Then we kept looking for the town of Cabra on the Illinois shore. That's where the Ohio River comes down, meets the Mississippi. We're going to sell that log craft, get on a steamboat, go way up the Ohio amongst the free states, be out of trouble. Ah, Jim, he said he's all over trembling and feverish being so close to freedom. He says when he gets amongst the free states, he's going to go to work save his money, not spend a single cent until he got enough to buy, to buy, well, to buy his wife, which is owned on a farm that's near Miss Watson's. Then the two of them are going to go together, save their money, till they could buy their two children. And if they couldn't buy them, the master wouldn't sell them. Why, then he's going to get abolitionists to go down there and steal them. Well, shoot, sure. about froze me to hear such talk. Why, Jimmy, he never dared talk such talk before in his life, coming right off, flat-footed, saying he would steal his children, children which is owned by a man I didn't even know. Man never done me no harm. Well, you see, I was getting it into my head if Jim was most free, who's to blame for it? Me! Well, it never come down before what, what exactly it was I was doing. And so my conscience got to stirring me up harder and harder. And finally I said, oh, lay off of me. Will you paddle ashore first light and tell on him? Well, just then, the lights of the town showed. Jim, he got all excited, thinking it was Cabo. And I said, nah, you better let me paddle ashore and see, Jim. It may not be, you know. So he gets a canoe ready, and hands me the paddle, and I show off. 
I get about 50 yards off, and Jim, he calls out. There you go. The old true hug. Don't know what gentleman's ever kept his promise to old Jim. Well, I just felt sick. There I was, paddling off on a sweat to town on him, and he says that. He just kind of, sort of took the pluck right out of me. I came right down undecided whether I was glad I started or I weren't. But I said to myself, I mean, you got to do it. You can't change your mind now. Well, just then, a skiff come along with two men in it, with guns. And they stop. I stop. <clears throat> One of them says, What's that over yonder? It's a piece of raft. You belong on it? Yes, sir. Any man on it? Just one, sir. Well, five diggers run off tonight from up around the head of the bend. Is your man white or black? He's white. And they went on. I know I done that wrong again. But I guess it weren't no use to me trying to learn to do right. I mean, if I'd have gone to Sunday school and all, learned how to behave, I'd have known what to do. But, you know, when a body don't get started off right when he's little, he just ain't got no chance. But then I, I say to myself, hold on a minute. Now, if you'd have done right, turned Jim in, would you feel any better than you feel right now? Well, no, I said. I feel bad. I feel just like I do now. Well then, I said, what's the use of you learning to do right when it's troublesome to do right, ain't trouble to do wrong, and what you get out of it is exactly the same? <laughs> I was stuck. Couldn't answer that. So, I just decided to put the whole matter right out of my head. And I was going to go back to wickedness again, it being in my line, being brung up to it and all. And for a starter, I was going to steal Jim out of slavery. And if that meant I was going to hell, well then, I'd just go to hell. Hmm. Huckleberry Finn. Well, now, uh, when I was a boy, helping to inhabit that little town, Hannibal, Missouri, and my comrades and I had one permanent ambition, to be steamboatmen, an ambition I managed to achieve. <laughs> so I hoped to follow the river the rest of my days, die at the wheel when my mission was ended. But by and by the war came. Commerce on the river ceased. My occupation was gone. I had to seek another livelihood. So I joined the Confederacy. Served two weeks. Deserted. The Confederacy fell. <laughs> so I went out west to hunt for gold. See, I was going to be a millionaire. Of course, I expected to find the gold just laying on the ground, ready for me to shovel it in. <laughs> I met a disappointment there. You know, it's like so many other pipe dreams of my life, all based on rumor. Why, when I got out there, I must have been drunk on the smell of someone else's cork if I thought I was going to dig for gold with a long-handled shovel. I had no use for a long-handled shovel. Oh, I could sit and admire other ones while they're using even, even shout encouragement from time to time. If I wasn't too busy uh, catching fly. <laughs> but that California get rich quick fever of my youth spread like wildfire. It is produced a 
civilization that is that has destroyed simplicity and repose of life. It's poetry. It's soft, romantic dreams and visions. Replaced it with a money fever, sordid ideals, vulgar ambitions, and a sleep that does not refresh. It has created a thousand useless luxuries, turned them into necessities, satisfying nothing. It has deposed God and put up a shackle in his place. Oh, the dreams of our youth, how beautiful they are, and how perishable. <laughs> well, let me see here. Hmm? Get this out? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Huh. Time for me to go. Oh, yeah, well, my feet are tired. You're, uh, well, <laughs> you are tired. Uh, now, you know, in this past year, my 74, I've received hundreds of letters from all conditions of people, men, women, and children. In these letters, there's, there's compliment and praise. Above all and better and all. There's a note of affection. Now, compliment as well. Praise as well, but affection? Mm -mm 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 -mm. That is the final and most precious reward any man can win, whether by character or achievement. I am eternally grateful for that reward. So, I want to leave you with a little illustration of the effect of affection on an appreciating person. Many years ago, I gathered this incident from Dana's book, Two Years Before the Mass. It's like this. There was this little self-important skipper and his little Massachusetts coasting sloop engaged in the dried apple and kitchen furniture trade. And he was always hailing every ship that came in sight. Now, he did it just to air his small grandeur and to hear himself talk. Well, one day, a majestic Indiaman came plowing by with course on course of canvas, towering into the skies, his yards and decks swarming with sailors, its hull burdened to the plimsoll line with the rich freightage of spice and and lading the breeze with their graces and the mysterious odors of the Orient. It was a noble spectacle. Well, the little captain, he popped into the shroud and squeaked out a hay. What ship is that? And went and whither? Well, the answer came back in a deep, and thunderous bass through the speaking trumpet. The begum of Bengal, 142 days out from Canton, homeward bound. What ship is that? Well, <laughs> that just squashed that poor little creature's vanity flat. So he squeaked back most humbly, Only the Mary Ann. Fourteen hours out of Boston, bound for Tetra Point with nothing in particular. <laughs> well, now, oh, what an eloquent word that only to express the depths of his humility. And now that, that's just my case. For in one hour out of the 24, no more, I pause and reflect in the stillness of the night and then I am meek, and then I'm properly humble, and then, for that little while, I am only the Mary Ann, 14 hours out, cargoed with vegetables and tinware. But, in all the other 23 hours, my self-assurance rides a white crest of public approval, 
And I am the stately Indian and plowing the great seas under a cloud of canvas, laden with the kindest words ever vouchsafed any wandering alien in this world, I believe. Then I am the begum of Bengal. Seventy-four years out. Homeward bound. Thank you, and good day.